This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, what we've been learning about uh, uh, gray vines from uh, uh, the gray vine genome. And um, before we start, because not of all of you, some of you I know, but not all of you are familiar with, with gray vines, I have a sort of a primer of grape genetics here that will help you understand or at least guide through the, uh, the next minutes of my presentation. So when we talk about grey vines, at least on the West Coast and the rest of the world, we're talking about a single species, Vitis vinifera, okay, which is quite remarkable. You know, probably the most important food crop in the world, and one, relying 95% on a single species. So this single species, species Vitis vinifera, subspecies sativa, is um, hermaphroditic, so has perfect flower with both functional male and female parts, and was domesticated from populations that were actually the issues with plants carrying either male or female flowers. And therefore, they were obligated uh, out outcrossing wild progenitors, these Vitis vinifera sylvestris species. So our cultivated grape vines, Vitis vinifera, are technically capable of, uh, of selfing. However, we don't typically propagate grape vines by selfing, by collecting the seeds from their fruit, because we want to maintain genetic identity and also because grey vines deriving from this obligatory outcrossing population, they suffer of uh, genetic load and uh, um, inbreeding depression in case of selfing. So typically, grey vine cultivars are both F1s of distantly related parents to deal with the uh, high recessive load in, uh, in grey vines, and they're also clonally propagated to maintain their genetic identity. Okay? Uh, unlike what we cultivate, there is plenty of uh, wild species around, around the world, and some of them are in North America, and I'm gonna talk about that uh, toward the end of my talk. These vital species are the issues, but they're also interfertile. This interfertility between vital species confounds a little bit what we call a species in the genus vitis, but has a very important evolutionary implications because those populations, either in the past or in the present, coexist. So there is plenty of gene flow and integration processes that lead to adapt adaptation and, uh, and evolution. And uh, finally, not to forget, there is some 5% of the viticulture made with other species, other hybrids, either hybrids between vinifera and uh, other wild species or entirely other species. Not to forget those. And some of them are used a rooster. So gray vines, our vitis vinifera is typically grafted onto rootstocks that provide protection to uh, soil-borne issues, uh, pest diseases, as well as uh, um, pH conditions and other things. So done. With the primer of grape genetics, we're done. And um, this should help a little bit, uh, guide you through uh, the different parts of my talk. I will start talking a little bit about what we've learned about uh, um, grape genomes by assembling and uh, studying them. Um, the importance of grapevine heterozygosity. So remember, we have uh, domesticated gray vines, selecting those individuals that were hermaphroditic in this highly heterozygous population of, of obligate outcrossers. Okay, so heterozygosity exists also in our uh, germplasm material that we use for cultivation. We don't, we don't grow inbreds, we don't grow uh, nearly isogenic lines. We grow F1s, and those F1s are highly heterozygous. And we're gonna see how uh, important it is when we study grapes. And then I will touch a little bit about uh, uh, North American wild vitis species and how we've been using the genetic information of North American species to create a vitis pan genome. And if the time allows, I will touch a little bit uh, on uh, our effort to make all the uh, uh, genomic information we have developed in the recent years publicly available. Okay, so this is uh, in a slide, the history of grape genomics. That started about 2027, 2007, when uh, the PN40024 genome was assembled and released to the public. Uh, you probably don't recognize this as a cultivar. I don't drink wine from a PN20024. You may recognize PN. PN stands for Pinot Noir. So it's an inbred line derived from Pinot Noir. It was created specifically for genome sequencing. Because of the issue of heterozygosity, which, which is pretty much in the way always when we do genomics, the scientists in, uh, in France and, and Italy, they generated this inbred line, partial inbred line, 
to produce the first genome. And as you can see, there is kind of a lag period, which is not uncommon in, in plants, where um, the first model genome is developed, and then uh, because of funding or because of technological limitations, uh, we don't explore genomic diversity. And until really until 2015, with the, um, when long read sequencing came in, that we start seeing an exponential uh, uh, increase in the available genomes. And of course, with genomes comes also knowledge of the uh, genetics of this of these species. Uh, uh, so I would say that this exponential increase is pretty much uh, due to the introduction of long read sequencing. So PacBio, in particular, at the very beginning. Uh, that allows, of course, to generate more contiguous genomes, but I'm going to show you in a second also genomes that can resolve heterozygous regions, uh, capability of sequencing full length transcripts. And uh, um, we push a little bit the, the boundaries here by uh, incorporating genetic information to generate uh, uh, homologous chromosome information. I'm going to show you in a second. And finally, the, the ability of, of actually analyzing diploid genomes. Uh, so uh, most of you must be familiar with uh, long read sequencing and how how they actually changed the availability of uh, uh, of genomes. How every every species of plant, etc., had the opportunity to have a new genome. Long reads allow to generate more contiguous uh, genomes. The beauty of of this system is that we can also what we call phase, so construct regions that uh, phase the homologous regions in heterozygous regions in a genome. So at the end of the day, what we were able to construct at the very beginning were what we call primary assemblies, as well as assemblies of the heterozygous regions, providing access to the alternative information on those, on those regions. As I mentioned, we, we pushed a little bit in the past few years to go from context or from fragmented assemblies to chromosome scale assemblies. And we did this by uh, using the uh, Vitis core consensus map developed as part of Vitis Gen 2 to uh, construct, uh, to both gain contiguity, so build chromosome molecules, but also to use the reciprocal apotype information to build the diploid genomes, which we're gonna, I'm gonna show you in a second uh, why they're so important for what we want to do. Uh, this is one of our first, the Cabernet Sauvignon genome. Just to point out that uh, it's always good to integrate information. So for a while in the lab, we were using PacBio sequencing in parallel with optical mapping to build the hybrid assemblies. That then with our AploSync uh, tool, we will be able to uh, assemble in phase chromosomes. This is quite outdated already because of the introduction of high fidelity sequencing. And this is a, a paper we released uh, this year or last year where we actually show uh, that uh, yes, uh, uh, high phi based chromosome scale diploid assemblies can be generated and can be also phased by using parental information because we looked at the genomes of three rootstocks that are hybrid of two of, 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 of two of these species and a third one. So by shared parentage, we'll be able to assign haplotypes to one or the other parent and phase the diploid genomes. Okay, so we have the tools and uh, by, by using these tools, one of the first observation, which I will skip this in a second, is the high degree of structural variability. So by looking at markers, it was clear that, of course, cultivars and uh, wild species, et cetera, are heterozygous. Uh, and uh, by looking just at the sequence, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, we can talk about over 2% heterozygosity. What, we be, what became clear early on when we started generating the first and the second and third, the very beginning genomes, is that we found a very high, extremely high structural heterozygosity. So when we talk about structural variability, we talk about insertion, deletions, translocation, et cetera, that impact the structure of the chromosomes. When we compare homologous chromosomes, okay? So within each of these genome, we find that homologous chromosome differ by 20%. And of course, being most of the, of the cultivar related to one another, we, we, we see the same degree of structural variability between cultivars. Mm -hmm. So about 20% of the genome being uh, uh, heterozygous at the structural level. And of course, this, this makes sense for the reason I presented before. Makes sense because we domesticated individuals coming from this obligate outcrossing population. Makes sense because our great cultivars are F1 crosses. Mm -hmm. 
we need to we need to breed varieties by by crossing distant species to limit uh, in breeding the pressure. The third one, it was not so clear at that point, was that also clonal propagation has, a, has an effect. And I will not touch this today, but just keep in mind that the heterozygosity that we selected during domestication has been exacerbated by hundreds of years of clonal propagation. Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, is a cross between Cap Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. The cross was made accidentally or on purpose around the uh, 1650s. Since then, Cabernet Sauvignon has been clonally propagated which means that mutation have been accumulating over, over the cycles of, of uh, vegetative reproduction, but never been exposed to sexual reproduction. So that heterozygosity accumulated by uh, som somatic variation has never been removed, selected in those small uh, clonal, um, clonal selection programs, but never removed by sexual reproduction. So, and we think that some of these 20% hetero heterozygosity that we find in the um, cultivated cultivars is, is heterozygous, so not phenotypically visible, but due to uh, this somatic, somatic variation. Um, and, and I'm gonna just touch a little bit, a couple of examples, why having information on diploid uh, chromosome is important. And this is how typically a, a diploid chromos uh, genome looks like with haplotype one, haplotype two for each of the 19 chromosomes of grape here. And now, just by looking at the information this provides, well, we're doubling basically the gene space we are observing. And again, we're dealing with the highly heterozygous uh, species, which means that we have the opportunity to look at different alleles, okay? And alleles count. And I have just one simple example here. When we look at Carmener, Carmener is a French variety nowadays mostly cultivated in Chile, famous for his uh, um, green bell pepper aromas that are due to the accumulation of methoxypyrazines. The uh, key step in the most potent methoxypyrazine accumulation is, is uh, catalyzed by this uh, methyltransferase. Well, when we look at this gene family of, was studied before us, but we could find the four paralogs of the gene family. For each paralog, we have the diploid information. We found the two alleles. Okay, so for MT2, we have two, MT1, et cetera. The OMT3, which is the one expressing fruit and we know responsible for this key step, is it, the interesting thing is that the two alleles have very different catalytic properties, which means that if you are a student and you want to, to look at the OMT3 of Carmenere and understand how methoxypyrazine accumulates, and you pick the wrong allele, the allele that is actually, actually has much lower uh, 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 catalytic capacity to, to catalyze that reaction, you will be very unlucky. Eh? So, Depending on the allele, you may have different biochemical outcomes. Another example I have here is in a, a muscadine, muscadine grape, Muscadine rotundifolia, that was known for a long time to have too low cyo resistance for uh, powdery mildew. Uh, we knew that there were too low cyo, and we also thought that this uh, uh, resistance was homozygous because you make crosses, you look at the phenotypes, and the, the flanking markers are homozygous, the phenotype is homozygous, well, the resistance is homozygous. When we look actually at the two loci, reconstructed both RAN1 and RAN2 loci in these species, we found that each locus is uh, heterozygous and the content on MBSLRRs is very different. Actually, none of the genes are conserved across the two, okay? So this means that now one single accession muscadine rotundifolia threshold carries four loci of resistance. Yeah? because two are, uh, are uh, heterozygous. Again, this was possible because we constructed the diploid uh, genome for this particular species. Now I have an example that actually looks at uh, domestication. So I mentioned before, our cultivated grey vines are hermaphrodites which means they form these perfect flowers where you have a functional pistil and functional stamens. This type of flower is not frequently found or is very rarely found in natural populations that are actually the issues where you have flowers they actually look perfect because you have both male and female parts. But as you can appreciate here, for example, in the female flowers, the pistil is there and functional, stamens are reflexed, you cannot see that, but the pollen grains are also non-fertile. So female flowers 
morphologically, may be hermaphrodites, but functionally actually female. Male flowers, the pistil is there, but it's not fully developed. Interestingly enough, female flowers cannot revert to male flowers under any condition because the pollen grains are non-fertile. However, male flowers under certain condition of stress or, or, or other kinds, they can actually develop a functional pistil, which, you know, the theory makes sense that if you're a male and you don't have any female around and you need to reproduce sexually, you can, you can if you can actually revert to a female flower, you can make seeds and, and fruit and attract the seed dispersal agents and, and still reproduce sexually. Okay, so we were very interested in understanding the genetic basis of this process, both the process of uh, 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 development of the issues, a population from ancestral hermaphroditism, and as well as how gray vines during domestication were selected, recovering hermaphroditism. And as you can see, 2020 was a shitty year for many reasons, but for for this topic, actually, was a, was a, also shitty because there was a lot of competition. But but uh, um, was a good year. So we had a lot of insights in the uh, in this locus during uh, those those couple of years. So going back to um, what we knew before all those studies. Well, most of plants, most of flowering plants are hermaphroditic. So the uh, presence of female and male flowers on separate individuals is an acquired trait, okay? So the ancestors, ancestral state is hermaphroditism. Mm -hmm. So what happens in this population that are, they were fully hermaphrodite, the first step is the acquisition of male sterility. Mm -hmm recessive so that by selfing only you will generate female that coexist with other hermaphrodites. The second step of this process of development of the issues population requires the, form the uh, presence of another mutation, which is the mutation that leads to a dominant female suppressing suppression, which means that at this point, the female expression is suppressed. Yeah? And all this dominant and recessive was modeled before actually knowing, knowing what uh, uh, genes, et cetera, were involved. And then finally, very important, was hypothesized that the recombination event, rare recombination event of the functional male and the functional female alleles happened during domestication that resulted in, uh, in uh, uh, hermaphroditic uh, flowers. Okay, so we start for hermaphrodites, we, we build, the issues populations by two step, and then we by recombination we recover the hermaphroditism. Okay, so that was the model, and uh, as and others uh, before us define sexual determination in a in a single uh, locus on chromosome two. Uh, this is from us, but it repeats pretty much what other have done before. So at that point, when we published actually the Chardonnay genome 2019, we had available the PN40024. Uh, genome, haploid. So this derived from Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir, we know, is heterozygous for hermaphroditism. Mm -hmm. So is what, what we think is a hermaphroditic allele and a female allele. However, this is a haploid, haploid. So just one allele is represented in this genome. Which allele we didn't know yet. Chardonnay, we knew genetically that is homozygous hermaphrodite. Cabernet Sauvignon, heterozygous for HNS. And right? so at this stage, we had just these three genomes to compare. The first thing we did, we compare Chardonnay, one of the two haplotypes with Pinot. Doesn't matter because we know that it's, uh, it's homozygous for this trait. And we already observed some differences. You know, this, these ones that I highlighted, for example, these genes were not present in the uh, Pinot reference. Okay, interesting, but it could be by, you know, technical issues or whatever. Um, so the other thing we had, we had the replication of the haplotype H because of Chardonnay being homozygous. We compare the two haplotypes and we find, so these errors are all genes, and, and uh, we find that the, the genes that were not found in the Pinot genome were actually present in both, both haplotypes, becoming, you know, at least based on this observation, good candidates for uh, uh, hermaphroditism, at least, uh, because HH is, is uh, uh, the alleles in, um, in Chardonnay. Then we have Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon, like Pinot, is an HF. Clearly, we had in our hands an hermaphrodite haplotype, equal in gene content to the Chardonnay haplotype, and the other haplotype, smaller, 
with a, with a smaller number of genes, very similar to the, uh, um, this is artificial, believe me, this is uh, the female haplotype. In gene content is the same as the pinot reference. The structure is different because haploid, by, by forming this haploid genome, they, they create a sort of a hybrid uh, uh, assembly between the female and the hermaphroditic uh, uh, haplotypes. Anyways, so this was the first observation, but there are limits here. There are limits because we don't have the male haplotype uh, and uh, uh, very little replication, of course. So we extended the observation to a, a larger number of accessions, uh, both from the domesticated uh, cultivars, mm, all these hermaphrodites from, uh, from domesticated ones, then the male, uh, male females from, uh, from Silvestris, so the natural, uh, the wild population from, from which uh, vinifera was domesticated, as well as Arizonica rotundifolia, so which are both male. And you're looking here about between 20, 40 million years of evolution, okay, separating Muscadina rotundifolia from, from Vitus. Um, so each of these uh, uh, line we sequenced and phased in the sex locus carried two haplotypes. So the male will be male, female haplotypes, uh, the female, 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 both recessive, and then hermaphrodites, either HF or HH. I don't have an HH there, that's part of another story. Anyways, so we have basically 22 haplotypes to compare. And first of all, talking about structural variability, what was very interesting, despite the fact that we're looking about, as I said, 20 million years of, of split, when we look at the, um, uh, the female haplotype, for example, very concerned. So this is the female haplotype of all those uh, 22 haplotypes compared to Cabernet Sauvignon, very concerned. Male haplotypes, I'm gonna show you in, in the next slide, the genic, genic information is extremely conserved, 100% conserved. Structurally wise, we have a large inversion in muscadine grapes and an insertion in Arizonica. Okay, so more variable than the female haplotype. <coughs> the H haplotype, of course, because of the bottleneck due to domestication, very conserved. Also, we didn't sample hundreds like we did later, uh, uh, but very conserved. Okay, so first observation of structural variability defines the different haplotypes. And the, the, within haplotype, we have extreme conservation despite the long uh, uh, time we're looking at. Uh, gene content, again, we have much time to go through everything, but when, when we compare the H haplotypes across all the uh, um, vinifera, the male and the female, et cetera, the gene content is 100% conserved. 100% conserved even in the presence of what we observe these uh, individual pseudogenes present only in the female haplotypes, but in 100% of them. So every single female haplotype had a pseudogene that were actually functional in the male and hermaphrodite uh, um, haplotypes. This was interesting candidate because it was shared as a pseudogene across all the females and the pseudogene, the mutation occurring and forming the pseudogene is the same one, those eight base pair missing in all the female haplotypes that are actually present in all the H and male. So these eight base pairs, despite the fact that here we're looking at Muscadine, Arizonica, so again, 20 million years of, of separation, those eight base pair nucleotides are shared by all the female haplotypes. Huh? And this is, was an interesting candidate for us because, okay, we validated with other markers in other accession. It was interesting because in Arabidopsis, the ortholog, IMP1, which stands for in aperture pollen one, is a gene that has been shown when mutated to um, induce the lack of this uh, uh, copi, this opening that, that allow pollen grains to, to emerge from the pollen, uh, the pollen tubes to emerge from pollen grains. Uh, and in fact, when we look at male sterile grapes, the uh, pollen don't form these, these structures. So this is our candidate. We're working now on the knockouts to show actually we can uh, reproduce male sterility by knocking out the gene. The other interesting um, gene we found is one single gene in this region of the haplotype that was actually the one that carried the only known synonymous NIPs across all the males and not in the female and hermaphrodites. So remember the female sterility derives from a dominant male gene, okay? So this became our candidate, this Yabi transition factor became our candidate for uh, male, uh, for, for female sterility. 
and the also RNA seq supported uh, the, the expression, the high expression only of this Yabit as your factor in the maze. And we did transgenic. And when we look at the transgenic, we did transgenic with empty vector, the female allele of this Yabit as your factor, and the male allele of the Yabit as your factor. So uh, female allele doesn't cause any change, any visible morphological change to the flower, overexpressing the male counterpart, what we think the dominant. Um, male allele that result in a in lack of expression of female. We have esternumerary stamens, highly uh, 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 impaired in their development uh, pistils. And sometimes, you know, the flowers don't open. So the, the petals uh, uh, contain, uh, and, and as, as seen here, they contain only, only stamens. So clearly an alteration in uh, uh, um, sex morphology due to the expression of this candidate gene. They, um, of course, there are limitations to this, in particular, is the overexpression. So remember, I told you at the beginning that male flowers can revert to female flowers. It's likely that the expression of the Yabi modulates that uh, uh, capability of reverting to one or the other sex. And by overexpressing it, we're really messing up with the, with the uh, morphology of the flower. Yeah. So we're doing more, more experiments. And one of them is uh, using uh, DNA affinity purification sequencing. We basically, we look where does Yabi uh, bind in the genome to identify the, the transitional network of the Yabi genes. And we did this both with the female and male allele. This is what puzzled me at the beginning. We have 187 genes that bind to the female allele consistently across replicates as well as male alleles. Same number. And when I see same numbers in biology, I don't believe it because it cannot be. But uh, it looks like the 75, again, seven numbers, same numbers, but unique genes are um, uh, associated with the male and female allele. And we're now looking at what, what these genes are and, uh, and follow up. And I have this picture showing that actually, you know, see much here, but the mutation doesn't help us because it occurs in the interdomain for which we have very low confidence by just uh, predicting uh, the protein structure. So we cannot really tell how the protein functionality changes in, in, uh, as a consequence of that uh, um, uh, single nucleotide. Uh, polymorphism and amino acid change. Okay, so uh, I still have time. Yeah. So now a little bit about our effort to look at uh, the North American vitis genomes. Why North America? Well, uh, one of the centers of diversity of vitis, 30 species, and very interesting enough for us, very interesting for us because particularly for us on the West Coast, um, Many of, uh, of the vitis species actually evolved in very dry uh, soils with high salinity and high disease pressure for uh, Pierce disease. Uh, so potentially a source of uh, biotic stress resistance and as well as a biotic stress tolerance. Uh, so remember this, we're looking now at vitis species. So these are the issues and interfertile, okay? So means that they can uh, uh, cross and hybridize. And that's what I presented you at the beginning. So what we did, what actually Andy Walker, the breeder in the department did over uh, decades, was to travel across the Western states, the Southwestern states and collect, collect uh, uh, gray vines. Uh, these gray vines are um, very few actually pure species. They're mostly hybrids between the uh, species I have highlighted there. Uh, so he collected them, brought back to Davis, planted them in a vineyard, and now we have them available for genotyping, phenotyping, do all the association study we want to do. And uh, we're funded by the PGLP program at NSF to uh, look at evolution of these populations, um, in particular in function of Pierce disease. So this is a bacterial disease that you don't have here, but it is very important for us uh, on this part or southern and western parts of the country because it uh, eventually kills gray vines. So it's a, it's a major scare for the industry. Um, and the first thing we did because of the coexistence of, of population of these different species over time, either in the past or in the present, was to ask what is the degree of integration. So how, much, how many times we find genes belonging to another species in the accession we're looking at. Removing all the, all the evident hybrids. Uh, and we find about, um, let's see, in KBs, about 200 KB uh, integration. Uh, across across the different species, with of course an impact on on, on number of genes. Uh, so this means that there's been gene flow, gene exchange across across populations, and uh, and eventually when we look at the genes, 
uh, at least in Arizona, deriving from the, these integration processes, they are enriched for resistant genes. So it seems like that over thousands of years, uh, great population have been exchanging genes, and those genes have been acquired and fixed over time because potentially adaptive to uh, the, uh, in this case, disease uh, or, other, or other stresses. So, said that, when we think about, so going back, when we think about uh, association mapping uh, in this type of germplasm, I would argue that having, having a single genome as a reference would not be enough for two reasons. One, the structural variability across succession within species is, is big. So you may have, you know, 20% of the, potentially the genes missing when you look one variety, uh, one accession or the other. And the other problem is that when you are mapping, looking for genes under QTLs, for example, on a genome that does not in include the integrated regions, then you will miss those genes. So the idea was to generate a vitis pan genome, and this is a structural pan genome. So we actually used the um, pan genome graph builder approach, and we selected uh, uh, species, pure species or the purest accession we could find that represent most of the diversity within uh, the, the germplasm we collected. Um, and, and here, this is something that doesn't really surprise. It's very similar to what would serve anybody building pangenome as a sorb, which is the more genome you sequence, the more information you gain, the more uh, information about what we call the private genome you gain by sequencing more genomes. And um, one interesting aspect to this is that when we look, for example, at the private genome, private genome is highly, highly repetitive. So about 70% repetitive compared to 30% repetitive of the conserved core genome. And, and more, most of this uh, repetitive uh, um, increment is due to the, uh, um, the transposable elements. And you can see there which ones are involved. The other thing is interesting when we look at the unique, what we call the, uh, the private genome and the dispensable genome, so the variable side of the genome, we see a decline in uh, expression levels, in the size of the genes, number of exons, and also in their annotation. Okay, so this means these are the more recently evolving parts of the genome. And, uh, um, and another important thing is, uh, uh, is again, the, um, the association with repeats and the fact that uh, appear to be more under positive selection than genes within the core genome. Yeah? And this is where we are with the pan genome, and I will not bug you more with that. Um, I think is as important as, as studying genomes is to make them develop, available to, to everyone because not everyone is interested in what we're interested in, but genomes are a good resource for our research. So these are some of, of the current status of, of everything we have done, both in terms of cultivars, in terms of vitis species and other vitasi we're using to study evolution of, of sex, et cetera. And they're all, um, the ones that we publish, they're all hosted by our website in Grave Genomics, where you can find um, each uh, accession has their own page. You can download the data and play with your, on your own or use our own tools on the, on the, on the server. And as you know better than I do about this. And we are trying to update now the, the database or the visualization or the tools using the new uh, um, genome browser it allow us to do more comparative work, uh, linking uh, synthetic regions, uh, be able to jump from one orthologue to another across across the database. And uh, um, yeah, and that's possible because of the people in my lab, not because of me, of course. Um, I don't do much anymore. I wish I was more involved in, re in actually the bioinformatics. But so for the sake of today's talk, I would like to mention Rosa, Andrea, and Melanie are the pillars of the lab in, uh, wet lab as well as bioinformatics and helping me with the management of the lab and, uh, um, and the students and, uh, and the funding. And, uh, and thank you very much for the attention. If you have questions, happy. Thank you. Yes. Dario, um, I, I'm aware of four grapevine, uh, grapevine breeding programs that are transitioning to new people, including <laughs> UC Davis here at Cornell <clears throat> Minnesota and then uh -huh. and then uh, down at Parlier. Yeah. So this fire hose of new information, how do you uh, think that's going to influence the programs of the new, new people? Uh, I think it's an exciting time because of that. Because I, I, I think um, 
in two ways. What is available, I think, is good to leverage. So to start off, you know, building, you know, genotyping platform or whatever, or uh, selecting parental lines in function of what is already out there. And um, because I know all the people that are uh, being hired, or because now is new generation uh, of, of net network being developed, is exciting because we can work together. And I used to work a lot with Andy Walker because he was next door. And and I'm looking forward to working with all those those new people in the community because um, what I do, I think, you know, is interesting for my own research, but is much more powerful or has an impact if it if it is actually used. And I think, you know, already already the fact that we move move away from SSR markers and more into to other type of markers, gen genetic information is is important. Um, I don't know if Chang is here. But a lot of the work done on haplotype markers, for example, is I don't know how much use the genomes, but I, I bet is having genomes available is important. So, yeah, that's it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much the high amount of structural variation poses a problem in chromosome pairing, and if that's why there's a lot of inbreeding depression, or yeah, yeah, I think more than inbreeding depression, which you know is not only the yeah, you're totally right. So there are multiple levels to the, to the, to the answer. So one, I didn't present this, but the, the degree of hemizygosity is very high. Hemizygosity means you're, you're missing the other allele. You have only one copy in the genome. Um, you know, that can be a problem. If you're looking at the progeny of an inbred uh, population, if you don't acquire a gene that is important, then it may, it may not be viable. So I think, uh, we don't know yet, but I think hemizygosity is a huge implication on on um, on inbreeding depression. Um, so that's one. The other one is what we observed over the years is the fact that certain regions do not recombine, and it's really hard to have dense, uniformly dense genetic mapping in grapes. So something I'm looking forward to work on is looking the impact on on recombination. Of, of the structural variability between homologous chromosomes. Because I, I, I bet that some regions, you know, we don't have markers segregating because they, you know, they are not because of structural variability. But we don't have, don't have the piece of information, is the theory. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the Yabi sorry, perhaps I got lost there. So, what's our identity of the Yabi sorry? What do you mean, identity? That the gene that you have. Yeah, identity with, with what? With uh, the transcription factor or what kind of uh, the identity of the gene? Yeah. 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 Is a Yabi 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 three? Is Yabi three homologous to the Rabidopsis Yabi three? Or what kind of transcription factor? Is a Yabi transcription factor? Is, yeah, is a transcription oh. factor of the family of the Yabis? And is the most similar one is the, the Yabi three from Arabidopsis, okay. which that's why we call it Vitis vinifera Yabi three. Because of homology, yeah. Yeah. and in Arabidopsis has been shown to participate when it, when mutated to the morphological development of flowers. So we're we're not surprised. Um, but again, the, just looking at the two alleles, we cannot explain why the male allele has an, an effect and the female allele does not by just a single nucleotide change resulting in a single amino acid change. But however, the transgenic suggests that the male allele has a. Another the thing we observe: the yabbies are known to cause curling when you overexpress them on leaves. And we can correlate quite well the expression of the yabi we overexpress with curliness outside of the flowers, which is good evidence that there is a allelic effect and also an expression effect. So we have a question from Geneva. Have you noticed genome synch uh, synchronicity in gene expression in hybrids? Any divergence in microRNAs? Not yet, not yet. Uh, we'll, uh, we, have, we have data sets of allelic specific expression, but we never looked in detail at how you know one genome may contribute to a higher expression versus the other. No, that's yeah, I would love to to know. Yes, yeah. Same thing with smaller RNAs, we haven't worked on. But happy to collaborate. It does. Yes. So you mentioned the prevalence of hemizygosity, and yeah. and do you have an idea, you know, given that? what the size of the core genome of Vitus is, like how many genes are the relative sizes of the dispensable? Yeah, so I can tell you that every time you compare two cultivars, we, we stick to vinifera, every time you compare two cultivars, you have about a thousand genes you cannot find. 
That's typical in inflation, what we call the private, because as soon as you add a third cultivar, the private goes down and you increase the variable one. The variable is what is shared, but not by all. Uh, uh, so I would say a yes, thousand, thousand gin on average. But if you look the, in the Chardonnay paper, I think it was about 15% hemizygosity. Zinfandel, we were around 8%. So it could be that it varies. It could be that it varies also. The clone you choose may have an impact. The history of the clone, the, how many times the clone has been undergone uh, vegetative propagation and, uh, and maybe lack of phenotypic selection as well. So, did I answer you? Yeah. Just a follow up on that yes. question. Uh, uh, the, the core genome that the virus gen 2 program uh, uh, did. Um, I, I guess my question is, uh, uh, and that's that's the one that allowed them to do markers across mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. genome. Uh, you know, how much, how much of the, the core genome, how much of the overall genome does that represent? Well, Chang, Chang should answer this question. I, should, yeah. I was not involved in that project. I heard 10 per, 10%, yeah. but that. 10%? But the, the, the challenge of that core map is that it really spans vitis. So it's not only vitis vinifera. And, and um, yeah, I don't know if it was only structure, also sequence based, the, the, the filtering. Uh, that you use, Chang, is ten percent. Covers ninety five percent of the genome, but with the spacing like two hundred kb. So yeah, you have spaces between the markers. Yeah. But so it's is a uniform, but it's uniform and the expense. Um, so in terms of structure, then how much it covers? If you sum up all the structurally, like it covers ninety four five. Okay. But the core genome we got, I think it's really like, it's decreased to uh, 20%. Yeah, yeah, 20. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the issue also when you think about, that's just a, maybe disclaimer. And also when you hear about pan genomes, it's tricky because the filtering that you, that you use has a tremendous impact on what you call variable specific or, or core. Uh, um, so always, you know, when you read a paper, look for that information because it could be the two papers are not comparable because the, the, the underlying bioinformatics is very different. Yes. Um, question on the breeding side. With, I understand that in like, when you grow grapes, there's certain groups of the market that like accept certain varieties and only want to use this. Do you see any change to that? Are like consumers like- Tim, you want to answer that? I think I think we talk about it, but we, yeah. Um, so I mean, we, we're going to be at lunch. It could be, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can talk. We can talk about that. I think um, there is interest. Mm -hmm. You see an increase in uh, interest for uh, cultivars, so no, no new material. You know, think about the germplasm. The vinifera germplasm is about three thousand to five thousand cultivars around the globe. You know. So plenty of diversity already to, 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 to choose from without having to breed. Um, California, we grow 95% uh, of the time, seven varieties. And most of the time of that is Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. So when, I, when I'm telling you there is more interest, it is really marginal. But by talking to people in the Napa Valley, Sonoma, et cetera, there, there is, you hear more about Southern Ital Italian varieties, Southern Spaniard varieties, uh, Greek varieties being tested for, you know, because the future of California doesn't look great. I mean, think about drought and the heat, et cetera, heat waves. And so it makes sense already to, you know, we should have probably done it before, at least have the general plasma out there and be able to identify which, which is more adaptable. But you can already, you know, predict what would be more adaptable than the, the varieties that are actually grown, they were domesticated or selected in the Bordeaux region with the uh, maritime, heavy rain in summer weather, which is quite different from ours. So, so there is interest. There is, of course, interest from, from, uh, uh, by the industry on, uh, on um, new cultivars that, in, that have some tolerance to disease. Um, again, what is, the, what is the acquisition yet? Yeah. Uh, there is, I, I would say, looking internationally, Probably there is more interest right now in Europe because of um, downy mildew and uh, copper use limitation by the European Union. 
but still is marginal. I mean, it's, it also we replant every 20 years. So it's not that we one day to another, we start replanting everything and, and, and adopting new cultivar. I, I would say that you don't get rich being a wine grape cultivar, uh, developer, breeder. Maybe table grapes and yeah, table grape companies do very well because there is much more uh, replanting and consumers don't care about the variety. They care about the, the taste, shelf life and um, yeah. So I would say there is hope, but it's a very slow process. And unfortunately, you know, when you deal with perennials, uh, it takes time. And if you don't, you know, you have to plan 20 years ahead, I would say, to, to answer the question that the industry will, uh, will need. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, only that uh, uh, Vitus vinifera didn't co-evolve with powdery mildew, ah, yeah. downy mildew, phylloxera. And so uh, it requires us here in our climate to spray Chardonnay 13 times. And wouldn't you rather, as a grape grower, have a variety that you only have to spray twice? That's the selling message. What is the answer? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> But also, so that's the thing, you know, I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but in California, we got really stuck with Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay because we did pretty good Cabernet and, and, and Chardonnay. Um, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to cultivate Cabernet and Chardonnay. I mean, if you have good hybrids, get, go for them. I mean, it, as, as much as you don't need Chardonnay or Riesling, you know, Riesling probably does well here. But I think... It, there is plenty of opportunity of innovation. And uh, unfortunately, that innovation is not happening at the pace we need, or at least outside of the labs. Right. Thank you, guys. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.